Lost Libia Chronicles, where I discuss all things lichen sclerosis. So if you know somebody with lichen sclerosis or you yourself have lichen sclerosis and you're interested in uh, learning more about the disease and how it intersects with mental health and sexual health, then be sure to subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so that you are notified every time that I upload a new video. Okay, so for today's video, I have decided to um, record my diagnosis story. And there's a few reasons I decided to do this. Um, I was initially planning on doing the video um, in a few months from now, but I realized that all the topics that I wanted to do kind of needed this as like a base reference point to kind of be able to point back to um, so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do the diagnosis story now. Um, so here we are. Um, it may be a little bit longer than my usual videos, but I hope you'll stick around for it or, you know, watch it in two parts, whatever works for you. All right, so let's jump into it. Um, so let's see, I was diagnosed in May of 2019 and I am currently recording this October 23rd, 2021. So a few years ago, I was diagnosed. However, I actually had symptoms way, way before I received my diagnosis. In fact, it took over 10 years for me to finally get a diagnosis. So my journey really starts about, you know, 13, 15 years ago. So let's start there. I was in my early 20s and this is when I first started to realize that something was going on down there and something was a little bit different. So what do I mean by that? Well, my initial symptoms were actually, they weren't burning or itching or discoloration. My initial symptoms were pain with sex. And so I'll elaborate with that about or on that as we kind of move through the video, because as I've learned more about the disease, I kind of am able to look back and realize kind of, you know, some red flags that were there and I've gotten more clarity about what was really going on. So I say pain with sex because this is how I first was describing it, or actually probably how I described my symptoms for the longest time. Um, you know, I would go into clinics um, and I would say, I don't know what's wrong, but I have a lot of pain during sex. And, you know, and this is why I wanted to do the diagnosis story, because this is going to tie into a lot of future videos where I discuss the importance of terminology. Um, because, you know, I was going to these doctors and I was saying, you know, my vagina hurts. Uh, my vagina hurts during sex. Um, because to me, the vagina was just all that is down there, which, you know, I learned in my 30s is grossly <laughs> inaccurate, but I digress. So I started noticing that there was pain during sex with various partners during those years. And, you know, it started off with, you know, kind of discomfort. It kind of felt like later I started feeling like maybe like I was being torn open. Um, hard to describe really, you know, it just kind of really felt like my skin was tearing, even though, you know, I didn't actually know if it was, that was just like, I guess how I would describe the sensation would be, it started with discomfort, and then that discomfort grew in intensity until it was, you know, past discomfort, and now we're in pain, you know, pain city. And then with that pain, I started, you know, realizing what the pain felt like, like it would feel like I was getting torn open. Um, and then it would feel afterwards like, I, you know, 
like a kind of stinging pain, like almost as if those tears, if someone poured like rubbing alcohol on them, that kind of sting was what I would be left with after, um, sometimes for days. Um, and, you know, I, I knew deep down that this wasn't normal. Um, I know that in chatting with my friends, no one ever spoke about anything even remotely close to the pain and discomfort and issues that I was going through. Everyone just seemed to be having pain-free sex and I was here with all of these issues that I just couldn't really wrap my head around, but I knew that something wasn't quite right. Um, so these symptoms, you know, they persisted with every, you know, new relationship that I started. You know, they were always kind of there. And because I just lived like this, I started to notice that sex could become easier if I was very strategic about it. So this is another thing that seemed to set me apart from, you know, my friends at the time was that sex for them seemed very easy and spontaneous and carefree, whereas I really needed to think a lot about, you know, the before, the during, and the after. I had to be really strategic about the whens and the hows of it all, which is something that no one had ever, you know, described to me before. Okay, so what do I really mean by I had to think and strategize? So with my body, what I realized was, and I remember telling my sex therapist years later about this, and I, I told her, I said, well, I kind of feel like my vagina and my vulva are like a pair, you know, a pair of shoes, a pair of brand new shoes that just need to be broken in except that my vulva kind of needed to repeatedly be broken in, my vulva and vagina needed to be repeatedly broken in, whereas typically a new pair of shoes, you break them in, um, you wear them for the first time, they hurt, you know, you keep wearing them, you keep walking in them, you start feeling a little bit less uncomfortable until the shoes are broken in and you feel totally good with them. So, I would say as long as I was wearing my shoes regularly, I could be in a state of, you know, discomfort, but not like excruciating pain. So my, what this kind of looked like for me was I would have sex one day and then I would need at least a day or two to recover. But then after those two days of recovery, I absolutely needed to have sex again in order to stay broken in. Um, and so I needed to have frequent sex, but not too frequent because that, then I couldn't recover from the pain and the tearing that was going on. So I needed that space to let the tears kind of heal up a bit. But if I waited way too long, there would be like a lot of tearing and a lot of pain. So I had to be really strategic about it, which kind of took away a lot of the romance and spontaneity and fun of it all because I was so, you know, engulfed and consumed in this world because I was in so much pain and I was so confused by the pain that, you know, I was just thinking about it all the time and I was really rigid, like, no, we have to have sex today. No, we cannot today. And so that's what my sex life kind of looked like from my 20s into my 30s and these symptoms did of course get progressively worse as the years went on. So these were my initial symptoms and I will say that from the very first time this started I was in and out of doctor's offices. So you know I would see my regular doctor, different gynecologists, I went to a lot of walk-in clinics and I also went to a lot of STI clinics, so sexually transmitted infection clinics, because in my naive understanding of vulvovaginal health issues, I thought there were three categories with which you could fall into if you were experiencing pain or symptoms down there. So the first was 
<clears throat> an infection like a UTI. The second was a yeast kind of infection. And then the third category was sexually transmitted infections. Um, and so I knew that it wasn't uh, a UTI because I didn't have those classic symptoms um, with urinating and stuff like that. <clears throat> now I was diagnosed with yeast infections quite frequently, as many of us are, and um, they would give me different, you know, creams and pills and, you know, mixes of the two. And no matter what I tried, they never really did anything. Sometimes, in fact, I felt like it made it worse. Like there was so much irritation down there because of all of the things that I was putting on. And, you know, in addition to putting on so much down there, I didn't even have yeast infections. So I was treating for something I didn't have, um, but I didn't know any better. So I just kept trying the different options, hoping that, you know, one would eventually be the magic trick. Um, but it didn't really seem to be yeast and it didn't really seem to be um, a UTI. So for me, that left sexually transmitted infections. So I went to STI clinics. I would ask to get, you know, full testing. I would describe my symptoms. I would, they would give me the tests and time after time, those tests would all come back negative. <laughs> and this will sound really weird, but every time I got a negative testing back, I actually felt crushed. I felt devastated. There were times that I was praying that I had an STI, which is wild because who prays to get an STI? Who actively is like, oh, please, please, please. There's nothing I want more in this life than to get an STI. Most people don't think like that, but I wanted it to be an STI so bad because if it was an STI, a couple things. First, it's not all in my head. There actually is something behind these very strong sensations that I'm feeling. So there's a sense of validation with getting a name to put to, you know, this mystery package of symptoms that you've been feeling for years. And then secondly, um, there's treatment. Now we know what you have. Here's some medication for it. So, and I obviously wanted these symptoms to, to stop. I wanted to have a normal sex life. I wanted to be able to walk without pain. I wanted to be able to not have to think about how I'm moving or what I'm wearing or how I'm sitting or will the person that I'm having dinner with, will they notice that I'm like, fidgeting so much in my seat because of pain and discomfort. Um, so obviously I wanted to, you know, get out of pain. So I was really hoping that it would be an STI, but they would always come back negative and I would just keep getting told there's nothing wrong with you. You look completely fine. We think that, you know, you're just really stressed out and that you need to just breathe and calm down. And then come, you know, the different statements like, you know, I had two doctors tell me that maybe between you and I, they're like, maybe you could just try like a glass or two of wine because it helps lower inhibitions and helps you relax, which I think you might, you know, benefit from. <laughs> okay. Um, well, first off, I think it's incredibly um, unethical and unprofessional for a medical you know, doctor to tell a patient to drink alcohol in order to not experience symptoms. Interesting approach. Um, oh, and then I would also get told a lot, and this one really made me laugh. I would get told a lot, you know, of course, stress, it's in your head. Um, oh, I would get told like, maybe your partner is just too big or maybe you aren't attracted to your partner. Um, and then my favorite was, you know, have you tried yoga? Which, okay, this is why it makes me laugh. Anybody in the chronic illness community knows the like eye roll associated with being asked if you've tried yoga for your illness. Um, but let's put that aside. I would literally go to these doctors in my yoga gear. I would be Lululemoned out. 
I would literally have my yoga mat like propped up against the wall um, as well as a little gym bag and my water bottle like I clearly like I look like I just walked out of a yoga studio and then they're like have you tried yoga though so of course I say yes I actively practice yoga on a daily basis and they would just be like okay well you know maybe yeah um, try some wine or something because we think it's just stress there is nothing we can do for you um, and this to me is really frustrating because I understand that you might not know what's going on, um, but I, I guess I wish that more doctors would refer out when they're unsure about what's going on. But that's a different video for a different day. So again, I'm in and out seeing different doctors and um, I was at university during this time and then moving to grad school and being a grad student and you know in university you tend to move a lot you go to different cities and so I was never being followed by a regular general physician for the longest time so I was seeing like you know whichever doctor was available at the university clinic whatever um, clinic walk-in clinic was open on the weekend when I had time to go I was seeing these kind of doctors so it is important to note that I was never followed by one specific doctor during this process I was kind of scattered all over the place in different cities, different offices, so on and so forth. But essentially, you know, everybody said the same thing. You're fine. You look fine. There's nothing wrong with you. We cannot help you. Just chill out. Okay. Well, you know, it is really hard to chill out when you are in that much pain. But anyways, so, you know, I despite being told all the time that there was nothing wrong with me I knew there was and I would periodically when things would get really bad I would go back to a different clinic with the hope that maybe that doctor would have some kind of idea as to what's going on so in 2029 I am like six year uh, six years <laughs> six months newly married and my symptoms are at an all time worse. Um, so I spoke about my main symptoms for much of my 20s being pain and tearing with sex. So the pain and tearing got worse, obviously, in time. And I was also experiencing now symptoms like a chronic itch. Um, and now I have had actual yeast infections in my life. And let me tell you that the itch from LS is so very distinct from the itch that is associated with a typical yeast infection. And you know, when I had a yeast infection back in the day, I thought there's nothing worse than this. Like this itch is so all consuming, um, but it, it holds nothing to the itch that comes with LS. So now I had itch, I had severe dryness and irritation, I felt I felt like my vulva had like a million paper cuts all over it, like someone was just cutting away and these cuts, these fissures would sting and they would burn and urination was uncomfortable. And then in, you know, 2019, I also started noticing something hmm, funny going on. So I, I kind of noticed that the the texture of the vulva, specifically like, you know, the labia minora, um, I noticed that they started to feel kind of tacky, like, kind of like I was sticking together. Um, and I would kind of have to like do like a squat to kind of like separate myself. Um, now, unbeknownst to me at the time, this was the early stages of my vulva um, reacting to the inflammation that's caused by LS, and this was causing my skin texture to change and to start to fuse, um, i.e. to kind of stick to another part of the vulva. But I obviously didn't know this. Um, at the time, it was quite humid where I lived, and so I think I just kind of chalked it up to like, I guess like the humidity and the heat is just kind of 
making things stick and I'm kind of dry so that's why um, so I didn't realize at the time that I was starting to fuse so obviously I wasn't doing anything to treat this and um, it got really bad around my birthday <sighs> and um, so on my birthday I had sex with my husband we went out to dinner and it was really great um, well it was really great but it also was awful because I tore uh, during sex and I was incredibly uncomfortable. Afterwards, during the dinner, I just kept fidgeting because it was stinging and jabbing and just I was so uncomfortable. And we got home and I remember I, you know, I don't know if it was that night or the next day, but I sat down with my husband and I said to him, I don't know what is wrong with me. But I know that something is wrong and I'm in a lot of pain and I think that we need to stop having, you know, penis in vagina penetrative sex for an indefinite period of time. I don't know if this is for a month, if this is for years, if this is for life, but this is getting worse and worse and worse and I can't take this anymore. And of course, if you watch um, my three-part interview with my husband, which is in the Sex and Intimacy series, you'll know that my husband was incredibly compassionate and incredibly understanding and supportive. You know, he actually was like, thank God, because he could see and he knew how much pain I was in. He's seen me suffer, but you know, like me, you know, we just kept getting told there's nothing wrong. So he kind of felt like, well, I don't know what to do, but I know something's wrong and I know I'm hurting here and I don't want to do this. So he was completely supportive, um, but I was in a lot of pain. So I Googled, um, you know, like Volvar Clinic or something, Toronto, and I found a clinic, um, that was uh, allegedly specializing in, you know, vulvovaginal health and women's health and STIs and all of this. So I thought, great, okay, a clinic specializing in this. I think, I'm pretty sure it was called Hassle Free Clinic, uh, downtown Toronto. And I went there and I was really like at my wits end. Like, I was like, they need, they need to figure this out. So it was a walk-in, so I went there. I got there like 30 minutes before they opened. I was the first patient there. I sat in the waiting room and I was called in by a doctor. She listened to my symptoms and then she did a physical examination. During the physical examination, she told me, you look completely normal. There is nothing wrong with you. She told me to, she's gonna leave the room to get dressed and we would sit down and debrief. So I put my clothes back on, I sat down on the chair and she basically proceeded to tell me that there was nothing wrong with me, that it was either kind of psychosomatic and in my head or that it could be neurological, but she can't help me with that. And she basically said, there's nothing I can do for you. <laughs> Okay. Oh, and I should say that the neurological definitely freaked me out for a moment because she did say uh, she was more specific with the neurological and said it could be multiple sclerosis, which definitely made my heart go a little because my mother had multiple sclerosis. Um, so there is a genetic link there, which does make me um, more predisposed to developing multiple sclerosis. So that definitely... Um, freaked me out, but I was also scheduled for an MRI to rule out multiple sclerosis for an unrelated issue. Um, so at least I knew that I was on, you know, a path to either diagnosing or ruling that out. But at that point, I had never felt so gutted in my entire life. Um, I felt completely hopeless at that point, and I basically gave up. Um, you know, I thought this was it. I found a clinic that is supposed to specialize in these issues. Um, 
where else is there for me to go? I mean, I just got told by a specialized clinic that there's nothing wrong with me and nothing they can do to help me. Um, I wasn't even, you know, referred out to maybe, a, um, you know, a vulval vaginal expert or a hospital or anything of the sort. There was no referring, no suggestions. Literally, it was, there's nothing wrong, you're fine, and I can't help you. So I gave up. I really did. I thought, okay, well, I guess I am just going to live my life like this and be in pain for the rest of my life and probably never have penis and vagina sex again. So let's fast forward a week. I am now, so uh, in 2018, I think, I, we moved to Toronto, my husband and I. And when we moved to Toronto, I actually did get a general physician. So finally now I actually have a doctor. And so I was going to visit my doctor a week after I went to the vulvovaginal uh, STI clinic. And I went to see her about something completely unrelated. To be honest, I don't even remember what I was going in for. Um, it wasn't really a big deal. It was just something minor, you know, uh, so it was supposed to be a really quick um, appointment. And I don't know how I got onto the topic of my vulva, but I started, you know, I mentioned a couple symptoms just kind of like in passing. And she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. wait a minute. Tell me your symptoms again. And so I proceeded to tell her all of my symptoms. And then she said, and I told her all of my symptoms. And then I also mentioned that the hassle free clinic told me there was nothing wrong with me and nothing they can do to help me. And I just had to, you know, learn to calm down, I suppose. And, and so she, you know, she paused and she, I could tell the second I told her all of my symptoms, I could tell that she was like, Hmm. Like something clicked. Like I could tell like, Oh, she, she might actually know what's going on here. So then she said to me, would you mind if I examined you? Um, I prefer to be the one as your doctor. I would like to be the one to tell you there's nothing wrong. And I would like to be the one to tell you there's nothing that needs to be done and nothing, you know, all of that. So I figured, yeah, sure. What's one more person checking out my vulva? She'll look and tell me nothing's wrong and everything looks great down there. So I go, we switch rooms and I go to the, you know, clinical examination room and I lie on the table and she walks in. <laughs> she barely looked at me. Like, I think like three seconds into just like initially looking, she goes, oh, I think you have lichen sclerosis. And I said, what is that? And then she, you know, went in a little bit more closely and examined, you know, the labia minora, the labia majora, the clitoris, all of this. And she asked me, she said, has your vulva always looked like this? And as you'll know from my checking video, if you have watched my checking videos, which I will link in the description box below if you haven't, um, that question was a question that really stayed with me for a long time and really impacted my mental health because when she asked me, has your vulva always looked like this? I didn't know. I was like, I have no idea. I've never really looked at myself down there, maybe a couple times, but never really like in depth and never consistently. So I was like, I have, I have no idea. And she goes, okay, this is definitely lichen sclerosis. She could tell by looking at my symptoms and by physical examination. So she said, okay, you can put your clothes back on join me back in the other room and we'll talk about what this means and what, you know, the treatment is and all of this. So, okay. So I go back into the room and she starts to explain that lichen sclerosis is considered an autoimmune disease, that it is typically seen in postmenopausal folks, but that some younger people do get it. Um, and she told me you are going to treat with clobetasol. It's, you know, a cream or an ointment and you'll use it daily. Um, she referred me to a gynecologist who she wanted to follow my case and he would give me, you know, uh, 
like my actual like how to use it and how often. Um, but until I saw the gynecologist, she wanted me to use it daily. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, she's like, oh, and um, lichen sclerosis does have, you know, a higher risk of developing into vulvar cancer. So that's a thing. Um, and, you know, I felt so many emotions and it was such a mixed bag. There was a part of me that felt like this was one of the happiest days of my life because I felt such relief and I felt so validated, you know? I mean, 10 plus years of being told there's nothing wrong with you, it's all in your head to be told you have a disease and this is why you're feeling these things. You know, for the longest time, I really did start to believe everyone. I really did start to believe it's all in my head and you know, I just need to calm down and all of these things. So it was incredibly validating. And then it was terrifying because when she mentioned the risk for vulvar cancer, I basically just dissociated. Um, I, you know, my ears started ringing, my eye, you know, my vision went blurry and I kind of just forgot everything that she said. Um, I was so overwhelmed. I was so terrified of developing cancer. I thought maybe I have cancer. I just, I just shut off. Um, so I know that I walked to the pharmacy after I filled a prescription for Cobetasol and then I went home and then I did what you shouldn't do, which is I went on Google. And then even worse, I went and Google imaged and it really terrified me what I was seeing and reading. I joined a couple Facebook groups initially and I had to leave because it was too fresh for me and I wasn't in the correct mental state to be in this group. Um, it was too early for me personally. Um, one thing that I found myself doing was I would read all of these horror stories and I would feel like, oh shit, that's my destiny. Like, that is going to be me. Regardless of what I do, I'm going to be just this bad. I'm going to have difficulty urinating. I'm going to have my vagina fuse over. I'm going to, you know, all of these things. And then the success stories, I couldn't even take those well because I would be like well how come I'm not reacting in this way how come the cobetasol didn't solve my problems in a couple days why didn't my itch and my pain go away in a couple days um, therefore I must be one of the bad cases and anyways I realized how much of an impact this was having on my mental health so I um I, qu I didn't quit like I I left the groups. <laughs> I left the groups. You don't quit Facebook. Well, I guess you can. Anyways, I left the groups and I just kind of spiraled alone. Um, I have struggled with mental health issues since I was a little girl. I've had debilitating um, anxiety. I have panic attack disorder. I, you know, I just, I have a lot of mental health struggles and I always have. So I think you know, me already struggling with my mental health and then coupling, you know, kind of throwing this disease and all of the question marks that came with it just created this blazing fire of mental health hell. Um, I was depressed. I was anxious. I cried every single day for months. I could not think of anything else. I was doing my PhD at the time and honestly, I have no idea how I managed to work on that. I really don't. I was probably crying as I was writing and thinking of my vulva. I don't know how I managed to write coherently, but somehow I did. Um, I, you know, I struggled with compulsive vulva checking, which, you know, was this kind of obsessive part of my anxiety that I hadn't really seen before. Um, and that was extremely distressing and very much impacting my quality of life. So again, if you're interested, definitely watch my two videos. I have one where I explain what, you know, compulsive checking is, 
or what that looked like for me and my experience with it and you know how I kind of worked to overcome that. And then I also have a video on three main lessons that I learned from my experience with compulsive checking. And I think those are really important. So definitely please watch that video. Um, but yeah, so my mental health was really struggling. And also I was basically like, I will never have sex again because everything I was reading was saying that lichen sclerosis causes painful sex and difficulty with sex. And, you know, I was reading so many stories about people just never having sex again because it was too painful. Um, and too complicated with their lichen sclerosis. Um, and so obviously I was terrified. I, you know, I had no idea what this would mean for me and my husband and our relationship. So, you know, I was basically um, a huge mess. Um, however, one thing that I decided the second I left, you know, my doctor's office when I was diagnosed, I decided shortly after that I was going to get a pelvic floor physical therapist because I was like, I don't want to lose my sex life. Um, it's important to me. It's important to our relationship and I'm not willing to throw in the towel this early. And I've been in physiotherapy for quite some time prior to this, I have degenerative disc disease and as a weightlifter, I would sometimes, you know, get various injuries and you know, just kind of need the physio to kind of sort me out a bit so I could get back to the gym. Um, so being in physio and rehab centers, I was very well aware that there were pelvic floor physiotherapists and I knew that they could help with painful sex. So I thought, okay, I'm going to work with a pelvic floor physiotherapist to help me address the physical aspect in addition to the steroids and um, I also decided I was like I'm going to find a sex therapist because I knew that actually my biggest battle was probably going to be my mental health um, as god-awful as the physical symptoms are I was like I am going to need a lot of mental support here um, and as loving as my husband is, as amazing as my family is, I needed somebody with an actual background um, in, in, in helping, you know, folks with my um, issues or, you know, yeah. So I decided I was going to do that. Um, and I should also note that um, in Canada, when you are diagnosed by your general physician, they will, or if they think there's a need, they refer you to a gynecologist. My wait time was nine months. So that was a very long time for me to wait um, to get my diagnosis uh, confirmed and to, you know, answer all my questions. So you would imagine nine months with somebody like me, like I had like a two page document of questions for that poor, poor doctor, not poor doctor, <laughs> but you know, I, I came with questions and tears. I sobbed through that entire like appointment. I was just, you know, I had two nurses dabbing me with Kleenex for my tears. I was crying that much. And then one was like playing with my hair and then the doctor was there at the gynecologist was very nice with me, but it still was nine months of having very little answers and very little support. Um, but I did eventually see my gynecologist. This was nine months. Um, now during this time I was treating with Cobetasol and I was treating daily. So for nine months I used my Cobetasol every single day, which is technically way too much unless you are a severe case and told that you need to do that. That is far too long for the most part. But I didn't know this and my doctor just said use daily until you see your gynecologist. So I did. Obviously when I got there, you know, after nine months of using the Cobetasol, I was doing better. Um, physically anyways, I was still like mentally, whew, we had a long way to go, but physically things were kind of under control. Um, I still was having some pain, still having some stinging, some burning sometimes. I still had a bit of an itch, but you know, things, things were better and things would kind of flare on and off, but they were definitely much better than they had been. 
So when I finally met the gynecologist that I was referred to, like I said, I cried through the entire appointment. I was on the verge of a panic attack the entire time, but the gynecologist was wonderful and answered every single one of my questions. Um, his staff was great. They were like, like I said, I had two nurse or a nurse just like dabbing my tears and playing with my hair and talking to me and consoling me. And they were very compassionate and took their time. So I left there with a lot of answers. Um, so that really helped. Um, so I had some answers. He put me on a uh, maintenance protocol um, where I was to use my steroids twice a week. So on Mondays and Thursdays, I will do a whole video on, you know, how I treat and all of that separately. But that was the protocol he put me on. And um, yeah, this was kind of my diagnosis story, but I just want to close with, um, you know, some positivity and some hope. Um, so all through this time, I had no support. I knew nobody with lichen sclerosis. And shortly after I saw my gynecologist, I don't know, I'm terrible with dates, like terrible with dates. I don't do numbers, but like, I don't know, maybe six months after I found lichen sclerosis podcast on Instagram and I binged all of her episodes and she did an episode, I don't remember which one it, it was at the time, but she was announcing that she was gonna do a virtual meetup in I think November of 2020. And I was like, okay, um, I'm gonna join up for this. Even though I was terrified because I am, uh, I'm very introverted and I'm very shy and I was just like, I. I'm very anxious and when I don't know what to expect, I, I get really, really anxious and I had no idea what the virtual meetup was going to entail. I had no idea how many people were going to be there. Um, was I going to have to talk? Like I have no idea, but I decided that I just knew, like I had this gut feeling. I was like, you need to do this. So I signed up for the meetup and I, um, was really pleasantly surprised. It was a very validating experience. I felt very seen and I felt very heard and I felt very safe. And I, I felt not relief because I'm not relieved that other people are suffering too, but it felt nice to know that I wasn't alone in this and that there were other people that I could now lean on for support other faces you know to see a face of somebody else with it was really quite powerful for me because until that point i didn't know anybody with lichen sclerosis i mean i had never even heard of it before um and then shortly after i you know i should also say that i've been attending these virtual meetups ever since that first one i have maybe missed two um and that's about it um, and so shortly after the virtual meetup, I did join Alice Warriors, which is a membership that Kathy has created, Kathy being the host of Like and Scrosis podcast, as you probably know. Um, so she created the Alice Warriors, which is a membership off of social media. Um, there are videos, events, so many resources, um, check-ins, accountability posts, the list really goes on and on. And I joined that and I found my community. And I will do a separate video on this because I think it really merits a lot more time and attention. But finding community for me was really the last piece of my my puzzle that I, you know, that I was missing from being able to really heal and find acceptance and be okay with lichen sclerosis. So that really was my final piece that really helped me. Um, and through this group, I found out about a book by Heather Jeffcoat, Pain, uh, Sex Without Pain, I believe is what it's called. Um, I'll have that book linked in the description box, but I'm not gonna go into that book too much now. I just want to say very briefly that this book is a large part of the reason why I can now have pain-free sex. Um, 
I no longer have any pain or tearing with sex. I That is amazing. And again, I need a whole video on that. There's going to be just a very, you know, there's so many videos that I have planned uh, on the topic of sex and sexual health because, you know, I think I really want to highlight, you know, how that book changed my sex life. Um, dilators and pelvic floor physiotherapy because they were also a huge part, you know, in conjunction with Heather's book, um, as well as, you know, steroid therapy and sex therapy. And there's just so much that I have to say on the topic of sexual health, but I want to close with, you know, there is hope. I went untreated for over 10 years. I lost a lot of my anatomy. I had very awful symptoms and I thought I would never have sex again without pain at the very least. Um, and I have been in remission for um, over a year and a half now. Everything looks good down there. There is no more active lichen sclerosis. I don't have any pain during sex. It is completely pleasurable, which is just absolutely mind blowing. And I'm so grateful for this. Um, the skin that was white has returned to a pink color. I have no more itching, no more burning, no more stinging, no more tearing, no more fissures. I have no more nothing. I literally do not think of LS other than, you know, because I do so much work with the Las Labia Chronicles and with Lichen Sclerosis Support Network which if you um, do not know about Lichen Sclerosis Support Network, they are a nonprofit focusing on education um, and lichen sclerosis, both on the patient and provider side. Um, I'm on the board for that nonprofit. I will link their website in the description box below so you can check that out and all the ways in which they can support you on your lichen sclerosis journey. Um, but yeah, I... Um, you know, it's just, it's truly amazing. And there, there is hope. It's, it's not overnight. you got to put in some work <clears throat> and be patient, but you can totally get this under control and you can totally reclaim your sex life and your sexual identity. So, <clears throat> pardon me, lose my voice. Um, so yes, um, this was my diagnosis story. I'm also going to share my diagnosis story where I talk on Lichen Sclerosis podcast about this. Um, it's a great listen uh, just because I love Kathy and she's such an amazing host and she is so entertaining to listen to. So definitely check that out and be on the lookout for a lot of content on the topic of sex, sexual health, sexual identity, dilators. Um, we're going to do a lot of videos on those and also a lot of videos on remission. Um, how did I get into remission? How do I stay in remission? What does remission mean? How to differentiate between, you know, the terminology such as remission and flare-ups. What do those mean? I'm going to have tons of content out for that. So if that sounds interesting to you, again, please subscribe to my video. Uh, not to my video. Subscribe to my channel, like this video um, to support me. Um, and that's it for this one. I will catch you in the next one.